Okay, welcome back everyone. In this session, uh, we will uh, uh, let some people present various science cases that will be the theme of discussion for the rest of the workshop. The people presenting will be some of those who uh, will be chairing the uh, the discussions, in particular those that will present that will chair the in person component. But I would like to stress that slides are often made in collaboration with all the chairs and other people uh, in the community among the attendees. Yeah. So as a first talk, uh, we will have Silvia Piranamonte talking to us about. Multi-messenger astronomy for gravitational waves. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizer for inviting me here to be here. So, I'm very happy to work with you uh, during these days. And uh, also, thank you to give me the opportunity to act as a chair and co-editors together with uh, Stephen Smart about this very important science case for Rubin. Uh, so in this very fast talk, because uh, Igor wants this, <laughs> just just kidding. Okay, I will try to introduce you to this the end case for especially for people that doesn't work with uh, gravitational wave uh, astrophysical sources. So uh, I will try to introduce you in this science case, and uh, uh, of course we um, we try to understand why we need Rubin. Uh, inside this, uh, this science case. Uh, for, for this talk, I, of, of course, I, I will focus only on astrophysical sources that right now are where detected by the, the gravitational wave detector LIGO and Virgo. So LIGO and Virgo are working in a frequency range between 10 and 10,000 Hertz. And in this range, we can have astrophysical sources like the coalescence of a binary neutron star or binary neutron star and black hole or binary black hole system. So this coalescence uh, can emit gravitational wave in this frequency range. And uh, I will try to explain uh, what will be the work of Rubin and why we, we are here in order to uh, optimize the strategies for the implementation of the target of opportunity program inside Rubin. So um, I will talk uh, a little bit about neutron star and neutron star and neutron star black hole merger. So what we, uh, and then uh, maybe Clasio, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about black hole black hole merger. So um, what we expect to see from an electromagnetic point of view so when we have a merger, when uh, we have um, a merger scenarios, what we expect is that the merger scenario leads to a central engine where we have a rapid, a rapid rapidly accreting black hole, which is surrounded by a massive disk, uh, which is able to launch a jet. Is that um, inside this jet, we can have several shells which collide between themselves and, the, and can emit gamma ray radiation in a very fast way, very fast mode. Fast, this, this kind of jet are very fast, energetic, and very, very bright. So this is called oh. short gamma ray bars, which is an electromagnetic collimated emission uh, and can, can emit not only in gamma rays, because when we have this jet that collides with the interstellar medium, we can have, um, an electromagnetic emission from X-ray to radio band, which is called afterglow, okay? So this is one of uh, one of the two emission we can have during merger of neutron star, star or neutron star black hole merger. And the other emission is, uh, is an isotropic emission, which is uh, which kill nova by the radiative decay of events um, because of photosynthesis of elements uh, due to a very special uh, process, which is called R process, uh, which is uh, a very rapid neutron um, capture, uh, which uh, can work only ve at very special condition, very high temperature and high and very high density. So what we expect from this kind of vision regarding the neutron are light curve so we have uh, a very fast decay in optical band and also in near infrared band. And here on the right, right 
uh, the spectral time uh, evolution. So you can see the rapid evolution toward red color in just one day. So this is just to, um, um, to focus our attention that when we are working with such object, we have to be very, very, very rapid. So we have to go on the target as soon as we can because we, because we know that they are fading very fast. The other problem is that from the gravitational wave detector, we have right now a very high and a very big sky map. So the, the other problem for to deal with this kind of object is that we have, we have to be very rapid in order to tiling the sky map given by the gravitational wave detector to, in order to maximize uh, the enclosed localization, localization probability. So when, once we have the sky map from the gravitational wave detector, plus some basic information about the source classification. So if there is or not a neutral star, or which is the distance, what is the distance, et cetera. So we have to decide the best strategies in order to tiling also the sky map. So of course we understand that, that the, mm, the picture is not so easy to deal with. So it's not an easy game, the, this kind of follow-up, especially with the gravitational wave, uh, so here is it's a very complex picture. It's very nice. I, I always uh, show this this kind of uh, this this picture because here you can understand that this is at the time scale uh, during the event in the electromagnetic in the electromagnetic band and also in the gravitational wave. So you you can see all all uh, the all what is happening for this kind of astrophysical uh, event. So you can understand from this picture that uh, our work is uh, always to have a request of a uh, um, network, not only of multi-wavelet observa observatories, which can cover huge kind, huge region of the sky. We have to get on target prom promptly. We have to repeat observation over different time scale and also multi-wavelet and go deep. So this is not an easy game, but we succeed. With this in 2017, when we, we when we saw the first uh, electromagnetic counterpart of gravitational wave, it was a merger between two neutron stars of 40 megaparsec. So everybody knows about this uh, this astrophysical event. So I'm not to I'm, I don't want to go into detail. We have time to do this. Uh, so just to show you uh, the the light curve we had with this, this was the 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 one of the no maybe it was the biggest observational campaign we had in our life in in, in all the astronomic astrophysical uh, history. So uh, and this on the right side you can see the time evolution of the spectra of this Kironova. So taking into account this of, of this for this experience, uh, we expect uh, that uh, okay this event was uh, um, happened in um, the second observation run, uh, observing run of LIGO and Virgo. So we uh, expect to have uh, other or uh, other of this kind of discoveries, but this didn't happen. So we are in the, uh, the four observing run of LIGO and Virgo. So despite the fact that we expected to have other electromagnetic counter, but we didn't have. And also despite the fact that we have dozen of neutron star merger and also neutron star and black hole merger in these two observing run, we, um, we failed to find the electromagnetic counterpart just because of several several facts. And all the fact is that we have to tiling very soon a big sky map, we have to go deep uh, and we have to get promptly on the, on the target. So what we expect in Rubin, the perfect machine for this, because he can tiling the sky map and we are uh, of course uh, are waiting for a sky, uh, reduced sky map um, in uh, 04 and 05, because uh, we will have not only LIGO and Virgo, but also Kagra and then LIGO, uh, LIGO India. So maybe uh, to get on target promptly, uh, together we go deep, we maybe succeed in discover other new emission component, for example, of the Kilonova. Uh, we can go deeply in the um, 
uh, in the study of the blue component of Kilonova, we can do population studies. So uh, thanks to Rubin and go deeply with uh, with Rubin, we can mapping the we can map the the diversity of binary neutron star merger outcome, and also we can maybe discover some electromagnetic counterpart from black hole black hole. Uh, or Lancer BNS, and we can also discover maybe the electro, uh, electromagnetic counterpart of a black hole neutron star merger. So uh, just go a little bit inside some detail. This is what I'm saying before. So uh, this is what we want to show you from Andrea Rune et al. Uh, the tiling, uh, Rubin tiling of simulated gravitational wave sky map for neutron star neutron star merger. Uh, with uh, 20 and 85 uh, square degree. So, of course, this means that we still need a large field of view uh, for efficient observation in order to detect the gravitational wave counterpart. And then we can we have to get on target promptly and deep. These are simulated, uh, some simulated kilonova light curve from Andreoni et al. 2022 in, uh, in the six Rubin filter, a different. Uh, at different distances with different and different properties of the ejecta from the, from the kilonove. This is for the blue and luminous kilonove. So, of course, we can ask ourselves that we can also do this kind of job with Decam or potentially also Panstar. But uh, we are optimistic uh, because uh, we need to go more deep. Just oh. At, at least of one magnitude. And for the red part of Kilonova, so I, I didn't have the time to explain that Kilonova emission has two kinds of component, the blue and, uh, and the red one. But for the red one, uh, the red Kilonova component, uh, uh, it's impossible to have uh, this kind of, uh, um, of, uh, of observation without Rubin. So uh, it's quite possible, in reality, quite possible true candidate will be somewhere in between, of course, but with Rubin for sure, we'll, we will win. So we'll certainly try to uh, to find this, um, this, this component. So uh, <clears throat> uh, talking about the science case and the vision and what we have to discuss inside this, uh, during these three days, it, it's this that uh, is that our vision, of course, we want to have a revolution of this science field with Rubin. So we expect to detect about 50 binary neutron star or neutron star black hole merger events with an electromagnetic counterpart. And these uh, are all the things we can study, uh, the, the, the field, the science field, we can study if we detect if we will be able to detect these electromagnetic counterparts. So I'm not going into detail because I'm almost finished, but the slides are public, so you can see uh, every time. Uh, so the immediate call for Rubin, of course, our case will focus specifically on what we can achieve during uh, the observation round five. So we, we, want, we don't want to propose a strategy for all the 10 years because we have to discuss about rate and which are are still uncertainty so the risk and i'm on and i'm finished uh is that we have the that the true universal rate for bns and neutral star black hole are still uncertain by more than factor 10 bns range of the ligo virgo Kager detector during a five uh, or, um, the duty the duty cycle of detector seems more secure uh, so we have to see what will happen during the first two two years run of course and um, we of course we have a lot of doubt but we are here to discuss about them and so uh, thanks to Igor, we have a tool, a notebook, where we can simulate uh, the, a, uh, the, a strategy and we can, uh, we can do online uh, to get all together. So of course, we'll, we'll discuss the uncertainties of uh, at this, um, at this workshop. So here are all the, think, the things that we, we decided to, to discuss with you. Uh, so this is the projected number of triggers to be defined. So the prefer, preferred of service strategies was six hours per trigger, but okay, we are here to talk about this. So uh, we wait. Just I want to leave just this slide for Clesio. Is it possible? 
Yes. Yes. Thank, Thank you very much. No, no, no. Just one slide. Uh, I was. I had the pleasure to. The, where is? God bless you. Okay. You can. Yes. No, no. Just, just one slide. Yeah. I, I am the pleasure to. Yes, it's your subject, so I want that you you can explain to us this. Uh, it just one slide, I promise. You can go here if you want. Oh, but you can you can go here. It's maybe it's, it's faster. Let's go. Uh, now we can hear you. Okay. So <laughs> the idea is uh, the DPHs can produce flare. There uh, there are a couple of models claiming that they can produce a visible flare. There are some uh, hand-based flares from the DTF team. Uh, and the duration of them, depending on the model, depending on the can this may happen. They can be super fast. Uh, like three day, uh, three day flares. They are a challenging flares to be observed, but it's also a, a high risk like game thing, right? Because they can use uh, to study the lineage uh, mergers, they can use to study the lineage formation channels, uh, and they can also uh, work as a as a device in the science if we can go with this, this flare and characterize it quickly enough. So there's a plot for the duration of the flares. Uh, there could be a, a two days. The challenging thing is when the first going to happen. The constraint when it's going to happen. Is it going to happen a week or two weeks or maybe a month after the direct installation event? Uh, I think that's all this model of information. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Sylvia? Yes, okay. it's yes, this is the IRL. So we are ready to work. So there will be plenty of time for discussion later. Yeah. So we will take questions on the okay. science case yes. at a later phase. We will be using that Okay, so hopefully now people will hear me better. All I've said is that there will be time later for questions and discussion on the matter. The next talk will be given by uh, Robert Stein and it will be about multi-messenger astronomy for neutrinos. Okay, so hi everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to be standing here representing Team Neutrino. Um, I realize we're a little outnumbered, so let me start by reminding you why neutrinos are really exciting. So we have known for now over 100 years that the Earth is continuously bombarded by charged particles known as cosmic rays. These particles can have extremely high energies, a billion times higher than we can achieve um, on Earth with the Large Hadron Collider, for example. And what that means is that somewhere out there in the universe, there are these natural cosmic particle accelerators. And they are so much more impressive than the things we can build ourselves on Earth. And it would be really great as astronomers to be able to understand where these are, how they work, and generally what makes them tick. The problem is that cosmic rays are charged particles. Charged particles are deflected by magnetic fields, and the universe is absolutely full of magnetic fields. And what that means is that if you're a cosmic ray represented here by the smiley red circle, then you will not travel in a straight line, but instead you'll find, follow this kind of windy, bendy, curvy path. Um, by the time a cosmic ray will reach the Earth, um, even if we had a perfect detector that could say this is a cosmic ray, it arrived from exactly that direction on the sky, that still won't tell you very much about where the cosmic ray really originated from, because as I said, you'd have to trace back all of these um, deflecting magnetic fields to work out where the distant source was um, it, it indicated here in yellow. So that may seem challenging, but it's okay because we have additional messengers. 
And of course, the messenger I want to talk about is the neutrino. So the neutrino represented in yellow here is a fundamental particle that is electrically um, is not electrically charged, which means it travels in straight lines. It doesn't interact very much at all. So it can travel through dust, it can travel through the earth even, and eventually reach us. And that means the neutrinos can point back directly to these cosmic accelerator sites, which we know exist, but we don't really know exactly what they are. So what is the state of play with neutrino astronomy? Well, high energy neutrinos were predicted for a long time, but they have only been known about for um, now 11 years. They were first discovered by the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, the world's largest neutrino telescope in 2013. And okay, so we've discovered that astrophysical neutrinos exist. Then what are the big questions um, to answer with them? Obviously the first one is where do high energy neutrinos actually come from? So right now we're kind of in this phase where we just wanna figure out um, as much as possible to allocate how much of the neutrinos come from different populations, because there are many possible popula populations that could produce neutrinos. We don't really know exactly how much belongs to which type. But then, of course, once you have these um, astrophysical neutrino sources, then we can um, learn an awful lot about um, astrophysics and particle physics. So how do cosmic accelerators actually work? Uh, that would be a really interesting question to answer if we knew what the cosmic accelerators were. Uh, neutrinos are really interesting traces of all kinds of things. So, for example, there are models which predict neutrino emission from choked jet um, emission in a supernova. So if you have a supernova and there is a jet, the jet doesn't make it all the way out, maybe no photons escape at all. But neutrinos are capable of traveling through matter. And so you would just see a neutrino burst um, coincident with what might otherwise look like a normal supernova. And that is exactly the sort of thing that neutrinos are perfect at tracing. They can tell us the interior of extreme objects, they can escape and give us information about what's actually going on inside. They can also um, reveal when high energy emission is, for example, hidden or attenuated. So if you have a neutrino at 100 TeV energy and a photon at 100 TeV energy, if the photon is trying to travel from some distant source, it will almost certainly never reach the earth because there is attenuation or maybe there's dust in the way it gets absorbed, but the neutrino again will be able to travel all that way and tell us that actually there is high energy emission going on in the source even though we can't necessarily see it. And then I think of less relevance to this conference, but in general, very interesting is that this is a really exciting physics laboratory because as I said, there's no way we can possibly produce particles with this energy on earth. So this is the only way you wanna test neutrino oscillations at high energies. There's all kinds of exotic beyond standard model physics tests that um, I am no expert in, but um, there are certainly a lot of papers explaining why these are really exciting. And in general, neutrinos can teach us about the multi-messenger properties of the transient optical sky. And so that's why I think it's a really natural pairing with Rubin, which obviously wants to understand as much as possible what the multi-messenger um, transient optical sky actually looks like. So where might TEV neutrinos actually be coming from? And unlike with gravitational wave sources where you're trying to find a needle in a haystack, we don't even know what the needle looks like because we have many possible neutrino sources that have been proposed. So these are kind of the main ones you might look for in optical. You have gamma ray bursts. You have supernova with, for example, choke jets. You have supernova with evidence of CFM interaction. You have active galactic nuclei, and in particular, um, those with jets, blazars, which point towards us. You also have tidal disruption events, and then I've added a new one that's only kind of come onto the scene in the last couple of years, which is luminous fast blue optical transients. And all of these have been proposed as potentially producing detectable neutrino emission, and all of them would have optical signatures that you discover with neutrino follow-up. And let's just remind ourselves, what do we know now? So we know that some neutrinos come from the galaxy, which is maybe not that surprising, but most of them are extragalactic. Um, to be more specific about where those extragalactic neutrinos are coming from, we know that some come from one active galaxy, NGC 1068, and then all of the other indications of where neutrinos come from have come from multi-messenger follow-up. So a neutrino alert comes in, telescopes point, they survey the sky, and then they identify possible electromagnetic counterparts. And so what we have is, for example, on the left, neutrinos from a blazar flare, TXS0506, and also from the optical, we have um, two tidal disruption events, and more recently, a rapidly evolving interacting supernova. So in general, I would say that actually optical TOO programs have been very successful in identifying very compelling candidate neutrino sources. So this is a technique that works. And um, there's a wide variety of optical telescopes already doing this. So at least I'm aware of there's Assassin, there's DECAM, PlanStars, uh, Tomo Igozen, ZTF. Um, so it's already a pretty crowded field and that's that's great. We're happy to have um, all, the, all the interest that we can master. Perhaps one thing that's particularly interesting about neutrino sources, these are two real candidate neutrino sources, both identified by the Zwicky Transient Facility. On the left, you have a tidal disruption event, and on the right, you have an interacting supernova, which had an extremely rapid 
um, LF bot like light curve, which rose to peak within something like four days. So on the left, you have really, really slow transients. And on the right, you have really rapid ones. And if you would have a GRB afterglow, for example, it would be even quicker than this. It might disappear within two days. And that means that when we're designing a survey strategy, we have to be agnostic. We know that it could look like um, the thing on the left or the thing on the right or something different. So we need to basically try and sample a range of different potential baselines with our cadence strategy. And so the idea is that when you do a TOO, you want to be able to be sensitive to all of these different things. So why should we use Rubin? Um, well, basically, I think this plot summarizes pretty much exactly why Rubin is really important. So if you imagine the neutrino sources follow the star formation rate, um, if you look at the, the CDF of where a neutrino detected by ice cube, for example, will actually have originated from, what you get is the solid black line. So what this, this plot is telling you is that the median redshift for a neutrino detected by ice cube, that neutrino is probably coming from a redshift of about 0.6, which is very far away. And a lot of the emission will even be coming from beyond redshift of one, for example. And so let's imagine that that uh, neutrino source has an absolute magnitude of minus 17.5, for example. Then with ZTF, what we would the chance that we would be able to detect it, so ZTF goes to a depth of the 21st mag, uh, you have that tiny orange thing in the corner that you probably can't even see at the back. The chance that we could detect a counterpart with ZTF is only 5%. So it is extremely unlikely that we would ever see um, a faint neutrino source with ZTF. And then by comparison, Rubin gets up to 30% probability, which is much better. And if we imagine going slightly brighter, so let's say not minus 17, but let's say minus 19.5, for example, then again, with ZTF, we're really only probing the tip of the iceberg there. We have about a 15% chance of detecting the counterpart, but Rubin fills in this space so nicely, it's more likely than not that Rubin would be able to detect the counterpart. 60% um, probability of detecting the counterpart with Rubin. So with neutrinos, it's always a game of chance. You're never going to be able to detect them 100%. But Rubin is so much more powerful than other telescopes. And this is really what we need because it's exactly where we expect faint neutrino sources to be in this kind of very, very normal luminosity range of um, minus 90. So why Rubin TOS? Um, basically, neutrinos are well localized, often within four or five square degrees. So one Rubin pointing is perfect. Rubin is deep enough. And what's the appropriate response time? We want to go as fast as possible to begin with, to get a baseline, and then also one day later to catch fast fading or rising transients, and then maybe an additional one after seven days, for example. That's what we do with CTA. Um, there is only ice cube right now, but there are more observatories coming in future. And I think in, in the end, we should always just be asking the same question, which is, um, how likely is an event um, to be astrophysical and how well localized is it? And we should, I think, only trigger on things that Rubin can cover substantially with one pointing. If you would trigger every single ice cube alert, which has an astrophysical probability greater than 50%, you'd get four triggers a year. You're only asking for a handful of exposures. It's approximately 20 or 30 minutes a year of time to trigger on all of these events, so it's very cheap. Uh, I think I'm nearly out of time, but let me just very briefly remind you all that there is another type of neutrino messenger, which is very exciting. That is, of course, a galactic supernova. So although multi-messenger astronomy is very hot right now, let's remember the field is actually nearly 40 years old. The first multi-messenger source was supernova 1987A. Okay, sorry. Uh, the first extra extra solar system multi-messenger source was uh, supernova 1987A, excluding the sun. And it, the optical counterpart was preceded by 20 hours with a burst of just 20 neutrinos. And nowadays, the 80s are long since gone. We have so much better detectors. Uh, we can expect maybe 10,000 neutrinos to be detected at one of the neutrino observatories. And we can get a localization of maybe three or five or 10 square degrees. So this is going to be immediately possible for us to trigger on and find the counterpart. We're probably, if we're lucky, we'll get one of these um, in the entire lifetime of the survey. So we should make best use of it. Um, because early optical observations of the galactic supernova would enable us to make really rich discoveries about supernova progenitors and explosions and improve our understanding of the transient sky. And let me just explain, you might say, why would we even bother? Because the thing will be so bright. So a galactic supernova is probably going to come from the galaxy. And some of those counterparts will be perfectly outside of the plane, no extinction, we'll see them. I mean, there's a 25% chance you'll be able to see it with the naked eye. You really don't need Rubin to be seeing one of these. But if it's more in the plane, it's suffering more extinction. There's also uh, approximately a 25% chance that the, the optical magnitude of the supernova at peak is less than 20th mag. So it could be extremely extincted. We won't know at the beginning which of these two regimes we're going to be in. So we need to be ready to capture not just the peak, but also the rise, the supernova shock breakout. Again, it depends very much on the filter, where it is in the, the plane and how extinct it is. And we won't have a lot of information, so we should be ready and open-minded. Um, and again, Rubin is perfect for this. It has the right localization, um, sort of right field of view to cover the localization. Um, 
in general, we could catch the progenitor. We should probably be ready to hand off to smaller aperture telescopes when we need to. So, you know, we first try and find the counterpart. Once the counterpart has been detected, then you can shift to using, for example, um, U-band, get all of the blue emission that might be heavily extincted, but still detectable with Rubin and not other observatories. And as soon as the thing is brightened enough that all telescopes can see it, obviously Rubin is not needed anymore. But in the early phase and the blue phases, this is essential. So we should be ready as soon as possible, I think. Um, the delay between neutrino detection and first optical emission from shock breakout could be minutes to, to a day or two. So it's a wide variety. We don't, we don't know exactly, but we should be ready to go. Um, and the false alarm rate for these neutrino alerts is once per century, so there will not be a false alarm rate. I think we should trigger on any high confidence alert. And we should also have a strategy, for example, Galactic 1A or a gravitational wave detecting neutrino alert, um, sorry, uh, supernova in the, the like Andromeda or whatever. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, I'm over time. Thank you, Robert. Uh, and I suggest we keep all the questions for the end so that we can wrap up the talks on time, especially for the benefit of those in unfriendly time zones who are following. So the next uh, uh, science case will be presented by uh, Tim Lister. It will be about uh, solar system objects. Thank you. Uh, right. So yes, I'm Tim Lister from Las Cumbres Observatory. I'm presenting this on behalf of the whole solar system science collaboration. We are even more outnumbered than the neutrino folks. Um, so for the motivation, uh, inventory of the solar system is one of the four main Rubin science goals. Uh, doing this is vital to understand the formation of our solar system. We need to understand how our solar system formed if we want to try and link this to the planets and small bodies we see forming in exoplanetary systems. The solar system is what delivered volatiles to the planets and led to the development of life on Earth. And if we want to preserve this nice life we have on Earth, that lets us you know, talk about surveying the universe. It's good to understand the impact risk to Earth from the small bodies that are still left over from the planetary formation. So this is kind of a complicated plot, which has way too many axes on way too many sides. But um, if you can focus at the bottom, we have absolute magnitude, um, which goes from faint at the left-hand side to bright at the right-hand side. If you make some assumptions about the albedo of your objects, which we don't know, you can turn that into a diameter, and that's there at the bottom as well. And then on the left hand side, it is the number density of objects that are brighter than that or larger than that size. And it's a logarithmic scale. So Rubin and the Neo, Neo Surveyor mission, uh, their main tasks is to complete this congressional goal, which is to discover 90% of all the potentially hazardous asteroids. So these are near Earth objects that come close enough to the Earth which have a diameter more than 140 meters. And that's in that sort of wedge between the blue circles, which is the estimated population of small bodies, and the red, which is the number of objects found. And in this particular size range, we're at 40% discovery. There's 15,000 NEOs of that size still to find. For TOOs, though, we're more interested in the much smaller sized objects. So there's a label up at the top which says Chelyabinsk. So this was roughly a 15 meter sized object down to Tunguska sized objects, which was roughly 50 meters. And that's the second arrow that's up in the top left that are close approaching to the Earth. So, as I say, we are interested in the in potentially TOOs for these things with an absolute magnitude H of less than 28, which are Chelyabinsk Earth Close Approaches. The smaller ones that are shown on the left um, just produce a bright fireball and drop meteorites. These are not a Rubin TOO priority. I do want to say, however, that I think multi-messenger astronomy ought to include meteorites because they're the only messengers that you actually get to hold in your hand and pick up. And just... But we are not interested in with Rubin in these like one to two meter sized objects. We are interested in these sort of seven, 10 to 50 meter sized objects like the one that blew up over Chelyabinsk. This was about a 450 kiloton equivalent airburst 
Um, that's the roof of a zinc plant that was blown off by the fireball that I've shown up in the top. The, the rate and the warning time of these smaller close approaches is uncertain and short. So that um, extrapolated line that goes up to the very small diameters has great uncertainty on it. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we need ribbon and why ribbon is going to be great. Um, looking at the known close approaches um, from the CNEOs database, and this is plotted in the histogram in the bottom, there are 29 objects per year um, in this size range that come within one lunar distance of the Earth, and there's 88 of them that are smaller, so uh, fainter than H of 28. We wouldn't necessarily need to trigger on all of these, um, but that's the rough order of magnitude of the numbers of objects that are going to come hurtling past. What we want to look at is potentially is objects that are inside the Earth or inside Venus's orbit. These are very scarce in previous surveys. Um, we have 33 objects known inside Earth's orbit and only one inside Venus's object out of the 35,000. Uh, the near sun twilight microsurvey, which um, the pointings are illustrated in the figure on the left out of the Solar System Science Collaborations Cadence paper, is going to be great for finding more of these. Uh, the population models are extremely unconstrained in this one, in this area, because we have very, so very few objects. However, most of uh, the objects that are going to be discovered in these, although they're massively increasing the sample size, probably will not need TOOs. We do have an impact risk for out of the sun objects like Chelyabinsk, things that approach the Earth from the direction of the sun. These have very limited warning time. There's very few Southern Hemisphere search assets. You need facilities that are able to point near to the sun to be able to pick these up. The third sort of science area I sort of want to talk about is ISOs, which are interstellar objects. The very first one of these was Oumuamua. Uh, this is the orbit of it uh, on the left with the orbits of the inner planets. Uh, this was the first one that we found uh, that conclusively had an origin from outside the solar system. We know of only two. We expect one a year, but this is again a very poorly calibrated sample based on two objects. The sort of tick marks of the dates shown on here on Oumuamua shows that some of these objects may have a very limited characterization window. They may only dip into the solar system briefly and then shoot back out again. And they are generally faint and fast moving. Um, and so this requires a large diameter telescope that is able to get good multiband SNR, which may be Rubin, but maybe other things. So this is the sort of summary of our thinking on TOOs for solar system. So the solar system science collaboration, we are united as a collaboration that more survey produces more discoveries, which is more better for our science. Um, it's simply a numbers game. The more we have, the better. Some of the objects, however, are just inherently rare. You know, they're going to be on rare orbits that only are detectable by Rubin for a short period of the 10 years, or they may never come back again. Um, for these new NEOs um, that are newly discovered, the uncertainty can grow very rapidly to tens of square degrees within one to two days without additional follow-up, which means you need a wide field of view to be able to recover them. Because the other thing is that these small NEOs are very faint. A 10 meter NEO is magnitude 28 at 1 AU, um, which is well below, below Rubin's search depth. As they get closer, they get brighter, but they also start moving faster, which means you get more trailing losses. Um, so you need the depth to be able to do it, um, as non sidereal tracking is off the table. We are likely to need same night or 24 hour response time for the very close approaches. In the past, we have had very limited amount of follow up time for solar system objects on large facilities. The time may be available on DCAM, DECAM, but however constrained with other groups, follow up is it going to be? And then on larger telescopes, um, mostly they have small fields of view. 
And also, we're expecting that the bigger telescopes are going to be dedicated to try and get spectra of the tiny fraction of Rubin alerts that come out per night and are not going to be available and usable for imaging. So that's our sort of thoughts. Um, on the trigger details, these are going to come from the Rubin Solar System Processing. Uh, all of new objects are going to be sent to the Mayan Planet Center, which is the single central broker for all solar system objects. There are two systems, one at JPL and one in Europe, that provide impact alerts on newly discovered objects. And the things that we need out of this are the orbital elements, so we know where to go point at it what the length and the quality of the orbital fit is, which tells you how fast the uncertainty is growing and what kind of facility you need to be able to re refine it and localize it. We want the absolute magnitude because that gives us the diameter or potentially the size of the crater if it's actually an impacting asteroid. Ideally, we would like to get colors because this gives you a rough handle on the taxonomy, which gives you a rough handle on the material properties and tells you how big a boom it's going to be, if it's going to produce a boom. Um, that, I think, is us. Yes. Thank you very much. So I suggest we move uh, forward uh, with the next talk, but please, uh, I ask the speakers to be available in a few minutes for questions and discussions. The next talk will be given uh, by Graham Smith, and uh, he will be talking about uh, lens cases for binary neutral star mergers and uh, gravitational waves. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Graham Smith from the University of Birmingham. It's great to be here. And um, I'm talking on behalf of rather a large group of people today, including uh, colleagues in the Strong Lensing Science Collaboration, Dark Energy Science Collaboration, Strong Lensing Team, and um, also some people mentioned here, uh, including uh, one or two who are in the audience. So I'm uh, talking about the our ambition to make the first um, multi-messenger detection of a gravitationally lensed uh, merger of a binary compact object. And um, our aim is to do this via um, looking for lens binary neutron star mergers and the different uh, messengers that we can detect from them. Um, a very brief reminder, if it's needed, gravitational lensing. Um, the idea is to um, is that these lens beautiful lens galaxies that we see in decades of beautiful uh, high resolution imaging now, they're plausible hosts. Uh, in the distant universe, meaning redshifts of one to two of um, binary compact object mergers, some of which will be EM bright and detectable with uh, Rubin. Actually, detectable with Rubin TOOs. That's the key point. Um, there's an awful lot of science in this slide. I won't attempt to uh, go through all of it. You'll be glad to hear. Um, in in very broad terms, what we're talking about here is uh, is detecting a you know a golden object uh, that can unlock uh, a very broad range of science. And sometimes I think of this as a bit like the equivalent of the dawn of optical strong lensing detections uh, in the 70s and 80s. And the future potential of this uh, is really I, I think as as huge as that. Um, some of these science uh, goals are uh, specific to what one, one can do with the gravitational wave signals. Uh, the, for example, this will be the first opportunity to test GR with both lensing and gravitational waves. However, the key point is that they can't do it on their own. Um, we need to localize the uh, source of these gravitational waves through uh, electromagnetic detection, in a nutshell. Um, a lot of attention is paid within the strong lensing area within um, uh, the Rubian Science Collaborations to time delay cosmography with lens supernovae. And uh, this would, um, to do this with in a multi-messenger way with a lens binary neutron star merger would to first order extinguish at least two of the terms in the in the error budget of these calculations and be a you know an 
dependent and not all constrained. Um, there's a broad range of other things. I will uh, highlight this, the neutron star equation of state. So one of the biggest puzzles um, coming out of the 1708-17 discussion was what uh, discovery is um, the, around the neutron star equation of state. The second image of a lensed uh, binary neutron star merger and, it's, and the second image of the uh, kilonova would be arriving as we get as we're getting on sky to try to find the EM image of the of the first one. Right. So this can give it'll be challenging. Let's not let's not pretend otherwise. But uh, this can give an opportunity to directly detect that the rising portion of the of the light curve. Um, uh, the mass gap is going to come back um, in on several occasions in the next few slides. So I will move on just now. So EM detection is both localizing to a host galaxy, it's localizing to the angular scale of strong lensing, right? Which we know now for decades is of order an arc second. And so it both unlocks and enriches the science very significantly. Uh, I've mentioned um, the gravitational lensing magnification. The uh, slide on the left just helps to position this in the context, the broader context of gravitational lensing. So we're in the high magnification regime, and this is a new plot that I made uh, a few weeks ago, and it is trying to put the different messengers for these objects um, on one plot. And what you can see is these different contours are showing the messengers from where the messengers from lensed binary neutral star mergers live along high magnification lines of sight to the distant universe. And you can see that the, the grab wave signals, the um, conservative kilonova light curves and the off axis short GOBs, all of these different messengers are living along the same high magnification lines of sight. And so the technology, including Rubin TOOs, is nicely aligned to actually pull this off. Um, and um, I've already talked about this free detection of the second kilonova image and getting the rising portion of the light curve that we see on the right. So I will move on to the next slide. So of course the key question then that might be super exciting, might have a huge impact, but is it actually feasible? What we see on the left are the um, predicted light curves of lensed kilonova counterparts to lensed binary neutron star mergers in um, the late 2020s. And, um, and the, the, what, what's important to pay attention to is the lower uh, dashed red curve in each case because not everything out there in the universe in this field is necessarily going to be 1708-17 line. So this is a, I can uh, look up if people are interested, what are the, the final details of it, but it is a conservative, faint, reddish kilonova uh, counterpart to a lens binary neutron star detection from grab waves. And you can see that if, um, if you want to detect it in a couple of epochs, then uh, we need to go very deep. Uh, and this motivates selecting very well localized gravitational wave detections um, and, um, and also to prioritize depth because the uh, because we need to go depth deep. So to prioritize a single filter to achieve that depth, we're basically relying on detecting an object in the first epoch within 24 hours, somewhere near peak, detecting it again um, 24 hours later uh, as as having faded by at least a magnitude, and then check a week later that it's still not there. And um, you can see that R, maybe I, are the most sensitive relative to the, the, the kilonova models. It's like the space between the red curves and the 3,000 second uh, integration times. Um, how might we follow these? These are probably not from the ground in terms of the kilonova itself. So we'll be doing um, uh, uh, follow up uh, from space because the light curves uh, stay red in the K band for around a month, maybe longer, but Mark Nickel won't let me trust his kilonova models beyond a month. So, plenty of time to get on the sky with a JWST um, trigger. So, uh, how will we select the candidates? So I've already mentioned sky localization. So, it's simply um, it's not a good idea, I think, to be trying to follow up 
poorly localized candidates. So um, the idea is that a single epoch can't epoch of Rubin T O observation shouldn't we shouldn't be planning to to do that for more than half a night, say. And um, and so uh, we select uh, the well localized objects um, and rely on the fact that. Uh, we're in the high magnification regime. And what that means, as you see with the black contours there, is that um, lens by neutral star mergers detected by, detectable by LIGO Virgo Cagra in 05 will not look like binary neutral star mergers because they're so highly magnified. They'll be brighter and look closer than they really are, just like we know from EM for a long time now. And so the idea is to select um, well-localized candidates that have a high probability of one or more of the compact objects being in the mass gap. And um, we're already doing this. We're, we have been following up candidates in a variety of ways in 03 and now in, uh, uh, well, uh, modulo Virgo's availability in 04. And uh, we're also starting to um, collaborate with colleagues in the LIGO Virgo Cagra lensing group to. Um, define what, what extra information would be really helpful to be available to the community, not on a private collaboration basis, but to the community to help improve this science in 05. Um, and so hopefully the um, public GW alerts will help this science and help other people in 05. Um, the mass gap um, is relevant to uh, quite a broad range of science goals that have been mentioned by others already today. Um, what are the biggest neutron stars? What are the smallest black holes that can result from stellar evolution? Um, and uh, what about multiple generations of mergers of compact objects to, to give you objects that might merge in this mass gap that are not lensed? Um, I've also been advised by various colleagues that we should say mass gap in inverted commas that may resonate with some in the audience. Um, I'm, I, might, I might be wrong in that last bullet point, but as far as I know, um, the lensed Binary neutron star merger interpretation of grab wave detections in the mass gap um, is, is the only one that is based on physics that we understand well enough, um, cosmological model, uh, gravitational physics, to inform um, an electromagnetic follow-up strategy. If I'm wrong, it'd be great to find out. I don't mind. Um, and so the, the kind of meta message here is it's an exciting region of discovery space and um, we'll learn an awful lot by, uh, if we select these carefully, design the triggers carefully, we'll learn an awful lot from going deep and fast um, with a small amount of time with Rubin TOs. Um, I've no idea how I'm doing on time. I'm doing okay. Wow, amazing. There are, other, are there other people who are coming after me? I don't want to... I'll, I'll keep, I'll just keep talking then. <laughs> no. Oh, easy. I've just got a, I just got a couple of slides. I wasn't sure uh, if anyone was coming after me. All right, good. Um, so who produces um, alerts? What's in the alerts? Um, so I just tried to collect together some, uh, some of the thinking that we've done so far. And um, so who does what in terms of um, alerts? Uh, in, in some ways, it's, it's sort of at the apex, apex of um, ongoing collaborations across SLSC, DESK, um, and also colleagues in the sitcom. And um, it will um, depend on some source injection tests that we're doing that is motivated by the high magnification strong lensing case, basically um, will merging, uh, merging image pairs of lens, distant lens transients survive the um, alert production pipeline and actually appear in alerts. Um, so we're testing that uh, and hopefully we'll have um, uh, progress on that um, in the coming months. Um, so our baseline hope here in terms of alerts from these very deep TOOs would be that AP works with minimal tweaks um, based on our um, tests in collaboration with uh, Eric here who's in, who's in the room. Um, maybe um, Maybe we can't make it work and maybe we'll need to invoke some prior knowledge of where the lenses are, uh, which we have, and um, do a lensing specific difference image analysis at the end of the night. Um, and uh, it's also going to depend on uh, how, if the community support our, um, and SCOC support our um, 
our ideas, how might up to 3,000 seconds per epoch be implemented in terms of exposures and so on. Um, what the alerts might contain, um, there's an ongoing discussion from a strong lensing point of view, maybe others, uh, other communities that we're very interested in zero sigma alerts um, in, uh, to be um, pushed to the brokers. And also, um, so we have our list of lenses and um, for, for the most massive of these um, non-standard uh, non cutout sizes would be very helpful. Um, waiting at the hours, not an option. Uh, so these are some of the uh, takeaway messages. Um, there's a broad consensus that this would be amazing science if we can pull it off. Ruben is the only machine on the planet that can actually pull this off from an EM point of view. Um, however, it's challenging. Um, the lens kill and are faint and fade fast. Uh, and this is why we prioritize single filter. Although one thing I'd like to discuss this week is Maybe it helps with such deep observations. Maybe it would help other communities if we divide into two filters. Um, so open to discussion and collaboration this week and um, big impact, tiny fraction of the time and excited to work with people in a collaborative way this week. I think that's enough. And uh, I'll answer questions in due course. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Graham and uh, all the speakers. Um, before moving to the discussion, uh, discussion session, I would ask if uh, anyone in the room has in mind science cases that are other to these ones uh, that they would like to very quickly mention in that these are the cases that as SOC, we agreed this would be uh, the most also attended ones for people to uh, gather in breakout rooms, discuss and write a report about. But if you have other things that you would like people to think for the future or might they you want to see folded in in these science cases, please take uh, a minute uh, to explain that. Is there anyone in the room who would like to present such a case? Mansi, uh, can you please walk to uh, the microphone? Could you please introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Yes. Hi, I'm Mansi Gaslibar from Caltech. Um, I think uh, I, I don't know what happened to the science case for GRBs, but we should consider extremely exceptional GRBs. Um, in general, I think for Ruben TOs, the bar should be really high. It should be only things that no other telescope can do. But certainly as far as far as GRBs go, there is a tiny subset that are exceptional and that should be considered. That's all. Thank you. And in fact, we tried to actually get someone to chair maybe a breakout session also for GRBs, um, but it sounds like this was uh, uh, not quite feasible, but we will try at least some type of GRBs to fold them in, maybe in the gravitational wave or have a section on the report. Yes, walk here. Actually, let me try with these microphones. Loud enough. Um, most of the people that have highlighted GRB as it should be under consideration are also in the gravitational wave of the messenger astronomy working group. So it's within that working group, a science case that is specific and that really leverages the moving capabilities like the last two views of organization, et cetera, or rather that um, it should be in detail um, in that science case. Thanks. Is there uh, any other person who would like to put forward the case? If not, for the last 15 minutes, I invite uh, all the people who uh, gave a talk in this session to please uh, come over here so it will be easier and quicker uh, to answer possible questions from the audience. So we still have a problem with the microphone. Okay, so the microphone that we can carry around still is not good enough for people to hear remotely. So I please ask if anyone has question to just walk over. Uh, it will be slightly awkward, but if we very line up there and leave room here for just one person, it will be just fine. Okay, 
let's open the floor for questions. Is there maybe one from um, online that we can address first? Uh, there are. Fed here. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's your, your own rules. There are several questions online. So in the order in which uh, Ted appeared. If I can do it, I'll get back now. So one question that was asked and it's being discussed online, possibly it's being discussed online, so maybe it does not require a live answer, uh, but I want to bring it up for everybody. Um, Tony Tyson, regarding optimal LSST TO tiling strategy, we need to repeat the multi-filter tiling many times in order to detect and eliminate bogus candidates due to ordinary transients. For example, we expect tens of thousands of ordinary transients per night. Um, the Question is being answered. Like, is there anything that you want to add other than yes, it's true? <laughs> if you want to discriminate, maybe I don't know if you want to answer because we need the yeah. whatever you say, you gotta say here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, it's, I think it's true because if you want to discriminate between uh, the the astrophysical source we know, uh, respect to with 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 the the unknown, of course, we have to think about. Uh, to change the, the, the tiling, but I don't know, maybe we have to ask to the expert of the tiling, of how to tiling. I don't know if you have some other comments on, on that. But yes, it, this is a thing we have to think about. If you have to change the mode of the tiling, but maybe, I don't know. Uh, perhaps the thing that I wanted to add is that Kilonova tend to separate themselves in a color versus time evolution space. So I think the idea that has been already proposed, which is to cover the area, the localization area in multiple filter more than once in the first and second night is the best way to yeah, design yeah, 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 photometrically. Igor, anything to add? Uh, yes, I think this has been proven to be quite a powerful combination. The evolu study the evolution of the source in luminosity and the evolution of the color in order to photometrically separate the most promising candidates from most type of supernova and other type of exogalactic phenomena that we would otherwise be chasing and taking spectroscopy of, which are most likely unrelated to the source. I'm actually kind of curious to hear how uh, perhaps people thinking about the one filter strategy uh, respond to that. And if you have taken this into account and how you plan to address the problem. Yeah, hi, this is Tony Tyson. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, okay. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. So it's um, in order to get a handle, uh, as has been said, get a handle on the physics of the source, you do need multiple filters, but maybe not a whole lot of them. But the important thing is to go through, uh, cover the entire uh, gravitational wave. Um, 90% area uh, uh, multiple times in these filters. And I don't think twice is enough. We did a study and uh, Jelko and I reported on that in the uh, a meeting back in, way back in, in Colombia uh, a while back. And it's necessary to go through it um, about five times minimum. Uh, so that then strings out the observing to uh, five hours or eight hours. And so it's it's a big job. And so that's why you want uh, a small a small uh, an area as possible, high signal to noise ratio. But in order to in order to um, retire the possible candidates, uh, that would be discovered because of this uh, these bogus alerts from ordinary transients. It's necessary to cover the same area in multiple filters many, many times per day, per night. I guess that's what's the hope of, uh, of many people. Uh, and I, th I suppose we can also address that more in detail in the uh, specific breakout rooms. Uh, uh, you want to come up? Yeah. We need to come up. Okay. Hmm? Do you want to come up to the microphone though? We need to, yeah. Maybe you want to point out that we have the notebooks and that we'll show them later today. 
Uh, yes, so later on, I will also show um, so a, a notebook I've prepared that will kind of aid in the visualization, uh, at very least, and exposure time calculations for the strategies that people will be able to propose. So hopefully it will be even easier to address this type of questions. Uh, Josh Bloom? Yeah, I was just going to say, in terms of um, cadence strategies, one of the challenges, I think, in the gravitational wave in particular, but maybe it's also true in neutrinos, is that the localizations can be disconnected on the sky. And some of the localization area can be in unfavorable places like near the sun or could be at different parts of the, the night. And so one of the things I'm concerned about in terms of the follow-up of the gravitational waves in general uh, would be blocking off a, a set amount of time for um, LSSC Rubin to go after an event when it actually could be that we don't need the telescope for another four hours and we only need it for one hour because that banana sets and then another banana rises, you know, several hours later. So there's there's a chance to that that we would be um, sort of baked into a suboptimal follow-up strategy because we also want colors and we want to be very thoughtful and we may decide we don't want to observe it tonight, but tomorrow night and a week later. So when we think about TO strategies over the next, you know, couple of days, I think it probably makes sense to concern ourselves with uh, not just blocks of time and or and a single block of time, but multiple small blocks of time. That's all I was going to say. Yeah, thanks. I, I suppose also people in uh, taking care of the scheduler would be interested in the, further exploring this type of uh, algorithms. Um, Graham, you had a comment to make earlier, or would you like to save that for other type of sessions? It's a response to your question, so uh, I'm, I'm very curious to hear that. <laughs> so, then I, so then I will answer your question. So um, I think there are um, the optimistic part of the answer to your question, Igor, is that um, the the lens lens killer and OV are at the ratios of one to two, and so we're basically probing uh, very much into the rest UV, and this is what's responsible for them fading so fast. So I think we, um, in terms of the, if I understood your question right, it was, it, did we know enough about the, um, you know, the the variability of the variability of the sky, certainly of the depths that, that I was um, advocating just now. Um, no, at some level, no. Uh, the pessimistic answer is that no, we don't really know much about the variability of the sky at 27th magnitude across very large patches of the sky. But the things that help us are, these things are gonna fade incredibly fast. So, so that's one metric. And another metric is, to be credibly uh, lensed, it needs to be next to something that looks and smells like a lens, right? So it's uh, that was the part that was the part that was sort of implicit in my talk. It's uh, uh, and we'll be building up over time fantastic knowledge within um, this Rubin strong lensing community as to where are all of the strong lenses in the southern sky. So uh, these are the reasons why I feel optimistic, but it, you know it's going to be challenging. Thank you. Oh, sure, yeah. Please. Uh, hi, I'm Shreya Anand um, from Caltech. So um, my follow-up question for you would be, um, what is the expected rate of uh, lens Hilanovi expected during O5? Because as I understand, at redshifts of one and beyond normal BNS mergers will not be detected in O5, right? Yeah, so I was just curious about that. Uh, so multiple independent groups um, have looked at the predicted rates and uh, the the most helpful number I think to quote is the relative rates. So what is the the number uh, number per year of lens binding neutron star detections divided by the number that are not lensed, and the the fraction is about one in a thousand. Um, and these are one in a thousand. Um, so the number of detections in this mass gap region um, that are lensed will be one in a thousand of the 
um, those that are detected as binary neutron star mergers that are not magnified. Um, and so uh, it depends what, um, what rate of um, binary, neutron, binary neutron star merger detections one is prepared to invest in and say, well, one in a thousand of those. Okay. And the dominant uncertainty is the, uh, say, of order, um, order of magnitude uncertainty in the local co-moving rate density. So the summary is we need the universe to cooperate and we need to be ready for when the, the universe cooperates. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Uh, may I ask if there is any question for a solar system science case, solar system object science case? There is a, there's perhaps an interesting discussion about sidereal rates that you have seen on Slack. Do you want to summarize it briefly since this came up? Yeah, so there was a there, there was a question online. Uh, this is Tim Lister. Uh, um, there was a question online about whether non-sidereal tracking is possible or not possible. Um, I'm obviously not speaking for Project, and Project can you know weigh in as well. But our understanding is that um, commissioning is quite constrained. Non-sidereal tracking is a, a sort of optional extra. Um, and there are also security considerations that various three-letter agencies and other agencies do not want Ruben non sidereally tracking their assets in certain bits of the sky. Yep. Then you can repeat for me that non sidereal tracking is not an option. It's not. not an option at all. And Bob points out that non sidereal tracking is not an option at all. Any because more? of the three-letter agent. Well, I mean, um, Ruben is doing a survey, and we're not, we don't, you know, there's many reasons why it's not an option. There's a lot of reasons that it's uh, There are many reasons why it's not an option. Is any? One of them is that uh, yep. we're doing the survey, and we want all the COs to conform as much as possible to the survey cadence and observing strategy. Not have separate uh, observing strategies, right? Yeah. And others right. are because we're supplying the data security requirements from the website agency. Many reasons that include the fact that we want the TO strategy to be as compliant as possible to the survey observing strategy because we are the surveys are our primary goal, and the other one is compliance with requests of three letter agencies. Are there any more questions uh, regarding solar system? Or are there any questions about the neutrino MMA science case? I don't think you hear me, but I wrote a question in Q&A for solar system. Is that Adam? Sorry, this is Adam Miller, yeah. You want to read it? Um, yeah, we can actually hear you pretty well, I think. Do you want to go ahead and just ask the question on Zoom? Sure, I can do that. Um, I was just wondering for the solar system case, I, I saw a few different cases, but I didn't get a great sense of uh, what's the typical localization, i.e. what area would need to be searched. And then I saw that uh, Stephen Smart uh, added to that, what is the typical depth that would be needed for the different cases that were presented as well. So I, I don't know if it's possible to just get a quick summary of that. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, the truthful answer is we're not totally sure because the way Rubin operates, detects, and links solar system objects is very different to the way it occurs in normal NEO surveys, which have sort of three to four detections over uh, sort of 40 minutes to an hour. And so those short arc objects grow in uncertainty very rapidly. Um, that is not going to be the case with normal Rubin detections, but it might be the case for those coming out of streak processing. Um, and so we have more work to do to figure out how exactly the uncertainty area is sort of going to grow and at what sort of typical distances we're going to be finding these objects with Rubin. Um, 
and so that we know how much warning time we get. So I'm um, hopefully that's the clarification non-answer. <laughs> The, and then for the depth, thinking that's well, the magnitude, oh, sorry. sorry, this is Melissa Brooker. The magnitude of the object depends on how close it is to the Earth, which would be changing rapidly over time as well. So that the depth is a function of time. And we thought this would also be a good question for the neutrino crowd. Would you like to answer that? Uh, yeah, sure. So I think in terms of depth, for example, I think I showed in my plot, it depends very much on the actual um, source itself. Uh, so obviously, if it's brighter, we don't need to go so deep, but we won't know that in advance. So I think what we should personally aim for is to be consistent and try and match to spectroscopic follow-up resources. So I think picking something similar to the normal survey observations is probably fine, um, because as I said, you're never going to be 100% um, certain to be able to detect the neutrino source, no matter how big your telescope. So I think, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we will interrupt here the morning session. Uh, thanks everyone to all the speaker. Super quickly, uh, lunch is ready, is on the patio right there. There are boxes with your name on. They are in alphabetical order, unless you requested something uh, uh, particular. Uh, so just look for your name. Uh, drinks are, pick, pick your favorite drinks. There is a cookie for each of us, just pick your cookie. Uh, there are, uh, uh, and yeah, and there are a bunch of other things that I like. Yeah. No. Okay. We have one hour. So it's going to be a little bit of a short um, uh, lunch break. Yep. That's it. Can have a look food. For the people online, we're going to keep the Zoom connection live so you can stay here. And we're going to make breakout rooms where you can elect to go if you want to talk. There are at the moment unassigned breakout rooms. You should be able to go to the breakout room yourself. We will mute the room. So um, if you need to reach out any of the organizers, do that on Slack. We will not have eyes on this connection for the next hour. <laughs>